Okay. I've been wanting to get to this. This meditating on the Word, this meditating in the Lord thing is really, really powerful because it's taking your Bible reading from being just building up your knowledge and just learning what the Bible says. It transitions it into a personal communion. A lot of people, if I would go around and ask people, and you'd be humble and honest, that how many of you feel like it feels like, what do you mean get alone with the Lord? Like I can pray about people and things, my family. I can have a prayer life. But as far as communing with the Lord, fellowship, and when I get alone with the Lord, kind of like, where do I go from here? Okay, here I am. I've had people say they'll go sit in their bedroom, close the door, and it's like, now what? And they kind of feel like they don't know where to go from there. So if I'd really go around the room, you'd be, and people be honest, you'd be amazed how many people would say, I've encountered that same experience. Where I get alone, it's like I set time apart to maybe meet with God personally, but where do I go from there? Or it doesn't seem really real, or like he's really close, or seems far away anyway, and that kind of thing. The Word of God, meditating in the Word of God day and night is a big deal. Uh, Reading your Bible... I make this comment a lot. I say, you know, I don't read my Bible to know about him. I read my Bible to know him. So just your little motivation like that can be a big deal. So you take the Bible. You can open it up and read it like a history book. Who knows that's true? Who knows you can just read your Bible for information? You just read your Bible to know what it says. And, and, and there's, a, there's a benefit there because it's alive and Holy Spirit will start having a voice in your life in those areas. There's a true conviction that can come in your life in certain areas because of things you've deposited. So there is a benefit in the goodness. But I don't want to just read it to have Bible knowledge. I want to know God. You want to know God, right? We want to know Him and walk with Him more effectively. So if the Word of God, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, I realized about the Spirit of God a long time ago, this is like my face-to-face encounter with Him. I, I look into who He is here. And no man can look into his face and live. So as I look in and see who he is, it dismantles who I am apart from him. And it raises me back up in truth. So I don't just find him here. I actually find the truth about me here. And the real me I find here. So I'm finding him and myself in him because we've always been one since the beginning in his heart. He saw me before I was seen. True? So meditating in the Word is going to bless you. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. So I did a little bit of it just sitting there. You know, you're sitting and you're reading, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who doesn't stand in the path of sinners or sit. And then you begin to express your heart. You declare your heart towards God. You'd be amazed how big that can get, guys. See, it's not about, oh, i got to read my Bible. No, I want to become the truth that it's speaking about. I want to become The word become flesh, okay? So I'm not just sitting trying to achieve reading a chapter. Or I got my chapter in today. Or I make sure I read two chapters a day. You know, you can do that. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But be sure that in that process you understand and learn to commune with the Lord. There there might be days in this thing that I'm talking about communing with the Lord. Well, honestly, you could sit down and read this first verse. And begin to get into prayer and communion, set yourself apart, deny yourself, receive and put on the new man. You could end up for a half hour just responding to that one thing from your heart in communion with God. And that's total viable prayer, communion, surrender and grace is all over that. And you read one verse because of what that's saying. And what you do is you sanctify yourself through your prayers. You set yourself apart. Father, I have no need for natural wisdom. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're giving me an ear to discern and hear just the way that seems right to man. That you're making it so obvious to me through filling my heart with truth. Lord God, I've lived a certain way my whole life. And those ways are over. Lord, you're training me up in a brand new way. I'm putting on Christ today. You you read that and you begin to pray this way and have communion with God. It's amazing how Holy Spirit will meet you there. How... Sometimes you'll leave the room and it'll feel like you just talked a lot about what you were. But here's the thing. He's expanding your heart with understanding. You're getting more out of the word. You're not just reading it to get through it. It's becoming alive to you. All of a sudden it becomes a part of who you are. Now you're embracing it as truth. And now truth's making you free. So you're leaving your bedroom and you're coming out of your bedroom transformed by spending time in him. Why? Because you're releasing faith in an area. 
And when you release faith, grace comes to meet that faith and begins to mold and etch you. Grace is like what fashions you. Grace is the the workmanship and the craftsmanship of God. It's, It's His skillful hand working inside of you to make you like Him. That's what grace does. Grace is God's ability. It's God's power. And He's willing to use it on your behalf to make you look like Him. So he's releasing faith in his value to God, in his love life, and and the ability to see people through God's eye, and that when he sees the world, I see what you see, Father, because we are one. You've put yourself in me, and you're the one that looks through my eyes, and you're causing me to see the world with the value they possess in your heart. Sit and pray in that, right? He can't read on love and just go out and do it. As he's praying this way, Holy Spirit's doing a work. It's supernatural. You're saved by grace through faith. Who gets the glory? Come on, we're not self-made. He's not going to just give some big trophies and some little trophies and some no trophies. Hey, you know, you go, wow, what a great Christian. Hey, and now I just want to introduce to the heavenlies, super Christian. <laughs> you know? And uh, no, what makes us amazing is that He's amazing and we've yielded to Him and His Spirit's working effectually in us. He's not just going to say, Brent, come to the front. He's super Christian. He did everything right. Right? He's not going to say that. I mean, well, (laughs) Brent, I didn't mean it that way. (laughs) But it's not, He's not going to get a reward. We're not going to put a little cope a cape around him with, with SC on it, you know, super Christian. And then, and, and, and then he leap off the hand of God and glide across the heavens. It's, see, we're, we're going to weep. It's, we know what we are is by the grace of God. I, I, before the gospel came to my life, I didn't even care about you. Be real. I didn't even care about you. And if I had anything to do with you, there'd have been something in it for me, whether just a relationship made me feel better, dependency was filled in something, or whatever. But it had nothing to do with valuing you before Christ. It had nothing to do with valuing you. And it's only the gospel that changes you on the inside and causes you to see the value of people to where all of a sudden you're not mad and angry and frustrated with people, judgmental. And on the inside, there's not envy and pride and comparison. Where on the inside, you actually look and you love people. Why? Because you've become one with love and you've taken the time to let Him cultivate your heart by releasing faith and saying, I want this. You see? When you do that, that's communion. Grace comes and says, okay... He changes your eye by showing you something different. You agree to it, and then He changes the way you see. He shows you there's another way to look. You say, yeah, and then He says, okay. Come on, this is not rocket science. It's, it's grace. It's salvation. I don't know about you, hard heart, attitude, pride, judgment, that inside stuff we do our whole life we've done is the fall of man deluxe. Anybody can do it. It's, it doesn't make you special. It makes you fallen. How's that? Because it's so proud. It's at the expense of others. It's exalting yourself, your own mind, and your own opinion above the world, above everybody. It's self-righteous. It's the fall of man deluxe. Eat the tree and you'll be God. So now you project your opinions on people and you sit with an inner counsel. Oh, what a jerk. What a jerk. Come on. You're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not somebody awesome if you sit there with that inside your heart and that's the assessment of people around you. Oh, what a jerk. No, that just means you have a desperate need for Christ and salvation. Degenerate deluxe. Well, that's right. Because what you're doing is you're valuing yourself above them apart from truth. Come on. If God lived in that eye, He'd look at the earth and say, what a bunch of jerks. 
They know what's right and can never get it right. What was I thinking? Why would I love them? Bunch of losers. Come on, that's what that mentality would suggest then. That isn't how God sees us. Self-righteousness is a wretched, terrible, awful thing. It's, it's, it's us getting saved by grace and then forgetting how we got saved. <laughs> and then looking at others through a different eye than God looked at us through. That's self-righteous. Do we have the mic? Jenny, do you still have the mic? Are you my mic lady today? You're awesome, thanks. No, that's fine. She's taking notes, good. She might just preach that sometime. That whole thing that you just <laughs> demonstrated up there, it, uh, ju- that's what sanctification is. There's just a separating unto truth. Sanctification is not this woo right. thing that happens. It's, it's a setting apart. It's just a se- so that's actually, that's what that is, right? It's exactly that's what it is. Watch this. Like, I was in wow. the world, now I'm not. I was... I was thinking the way a man thinks. I was thinking, watch, this is, I was thinking for me one minute ago. Now I've looked into the word and went, whoa, and I get convicted. This is repentance. Now I change my mind. I think, wait a minute, I was living for me. I'm selfish. That's just so ridiculous. All I care about is really me. And honestly, me, when I cared about me, I didn't even like me. Truly, I didn't even like me. I didn't even like who I was. I didn't like myself at all, but I wanted you to love what I didn't like because then it would try to meet, fill that void because I had so much lack of identity that if you would love me, it would help me like me. Can you imagine living that way? And then you enter into relationship with someone with all that twisted, whack motivation. And they become the meeting of your need instead of your love. That's why I get on this topic so big because that happens all the time. Insecurity, identity crisis, meet one another. Yes, yeah, uh, is right. That's why what we say we love, we can hurt and devastate and cut off in time. <laughs> I get on that topic and stuff goes through me like crazy. But watch this. Let me get back on track here with, with sanctification. Watch. I read the word. And the word gives light. In his light, we see light. His word is the entranceway to light. So his word is truth. It's light. I read the word and all of a sudden, another way, which is the way, comes to knowledge. You get it? My heart goes, wow, I've been living totally opposite of this. Right? Repent. You begin to change the way you think and you go, whoa, man, I don't want to live for myself. God, I don't want to... And all of a sudden, you're repenting and salvation's coming. Why? Because God is removing that. Faith is being released. My life is worth living. There's more to me than what it seemed. I am worth your salvation because you made me for this, not this. And all of a sudden, you're changing. It's repentance. And grace is coming over your life. And it's making you the very living product and expression of what you're now seeing. You see? So you're stepping out of the old. This is sanctification. Stepping out of the old into the new. And now you're set apart, washed through the blood, forgiven by God, filled with His Spirit for a purpose. Does this make sense? It's a supernatural, awesome spiritual process. Now people say, well, the sanctifying process in the sense of being separated from darkness is a a right now thing. But the sanctifying process in the sense of the saving of your soul and the redeeming and renewing of your mind, you walk in that and grow in that at, I'm just going to be plain, at the level you surrender. It says you're, he has already through one sacrifice perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That means those who are being cultivated in truth and manifesting truth, you're growing up into Him. But it's at the level you surrender. Because if you hold on to rights, if you draw lines, then you're only receiving levels of grace according to what you're willing to believe. But if you sell out, if you see Jesus and you purpose to follow Him and you get along with God and just give it all. It was like that little note I read to you that one of the students handed me. You purposed in your heart to never again live your life for your own motives. You gave yourself to God and He showed you His salvation. He saved you. That's exactly what happened to me. 
I saw clear what was motivating me and didn't want that to ever motivate me again. So I told God that and gave my heart to Him in that way and my prayers began to dictate that and declare that and I stayed in that surrendered place and grace comes and makes it your reality. It's where all of a sudden I'm not trying not to be selfish. You get what I'm saying? It's just your heart. It's the way it is. It's just all of a sudden I'm not trying to love you. Come on, if I'm trying to love you, it means I don't. I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm just trying to love, brother. I'm trying to love. No, no. I'm just trying to love him right now. I'm just trying to love him. <laughs> You'll never get there that way. I saw your hand. I'll call you in a music. Here's what you do. When that's trying to happen and you're tending to see the worst in them and they're rubbing you the wrong way. Father, I thank you. You never get rubbed the wrong way. Whatever's causing this and however I feel and whatever's rationalizing my feelings right now, I thank you that you teach me, that you show me, that you even remove that away and just continue to show me the value of this person. You love them. You shed the blood of Jesus. For the last two days, I've been focused on their weaknesses. And God, right now, I just focus on their strengths and the blessing of the potential of their life. And if I would have to, if I would have to, I would speak out and declare their destiny, their value, just as if I was praying over my own life. Why? So that I could start seeing them at the same value I see myself and I could never project from above them and talk down to them. See what I'm saying? Because that's what you do when you're frustrated with a person. You've elevated yourself, whether you realize it or not. You've elevated yourself above them, and now you're talking from the place of demeaning them. Every mountain's low. Every valley's... There's no high place and no low life. No hot shot low life. We all need the blood of Jesus, and by His grace, we're all saved. We all have equal, amazing value. And if I have that value and I'm, see, I'm not on an island by myself with Jesus getting all built up in the spirit and then looking down on you. I'm with Jesus getting all built up in the spirit so I can see you exactly how he sees me. That's the key. Right? Go ahead. Sorry, I, I did see. Uh, dang, it's like you, you like answer the question like when okay. someone raises their hand, you always like start speaking and then you're answering the question before they speak it. Well, good. <laughs> that was a fly like, Holy Ghost probably. We'll blame him. Like, <laughs> he can take it. When, I think what keeps me back and probably a lot of people from that intimacy with God is like you don't feel like you're fully pleased, pleasing him, like he's already pleased with you and you're trying to do it out of a... Mm -hmm. um, you like I could even look at your life and just see the reality that you have. I'm like, oh, I want that. I need to do something to get to that for God. I need to really please Him so I can have that with Him type mentality. And then you go in there and you're you're trying to strive and mm -hmm. and you're. I've heard you say before, like when you're focused on yourself, that's where discouragement comes. Well, some people get alone in that place, and they and what rises up in them, it just sometimes happens automatically, is what you judge yourself in, what you feel still lacking in your life, what you're not fulfilling, what's still missing. And there's times that can be convictions in God. They can be in the Holy Spirit because you have truth in you, and they're just areas to surrender to you. But what people do is then they put that on as a garment, as if this is me, and it's almost like here I am with you, and I'm like this, and, uh, and it doesn't invoke intimacy. Man, if you have that kind of stuff going on, it's not a bad thing. It's never condemnation. So just start naked and not ashamed. Just start unraveling and undressing before God those things. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But, but there's another thing I want to address, and I'll let you finish your heart. You have to be very careful that you don't compare yourself to yeah. one another, but that you're inspired by one another to follow after Christ as you see something in them you appreciate. But if you compare yourself to them and you feel like, wow, he's so pleasing to God. He does this and that. And I see the reality. I sure don't have that. Even if I'm preaching, some people tend to hear what I'm preaching to locate where they're not instead of where God's pointing. Mm -hmm. See, it's a, it's, we've been trained in an ear of condemnation and works. And legalism and law. We don't realize we've been trained in that way. So here's the deal. 
you are already pleasing to him. He is yeah. pleased to love you, save you. So you have to stand there, start there. You're not introspecting yourself. You're getting alone with God. If some conviction rises in your heart in that process, man, the ear you hear it in is huge. All of a sudden, something comes to light or you think, man, you know, it doesn't have to be this way or I've kind of held on to this or I haven't really walked strong in this way. All of a sudden, that to me, I receive that as conviction. <laughs> conviction and condemnation are totally two different things. Conviction means to shine light upon. Condemnation means I'm judged for a thing. You're never judged by God. He did not come to judge you, but to save you, right? So when convictions come, don't misinterpret them and let a legalistic mindset beat you down when God's lifting you up. So he's trimming. That's like a circumcision, if you will, of the heart. He's just cutting things off. So take off that garment. You don't look good in that. That wasn't made for you. That wasn't tailored for you. That is not who you are. You don't look good in that. Take that thing off. You look better undressed, right? Amen. Go ahead, but well, finish your thought. It's not so much like that. It's like, um, like I'll get pumped up just realizing who I am in Christ sometimes, and then like just being that, and then I hear something from some preacher or somebody, and then I feel like um, it's almost like, well, I don't have that, and then I get in a mentality where I need to work for that type thing. Not like, uh, not like putting off sin, but almost like. Like you're, you're chasing your tail type thing is what happens. Like you already have it, but you're, you're, you keep on going to get some right. special gift. Yeah, and there's thing. still, there's something, in, uh, and I hope you can hear me clear on this, that comparison thing. Because when you hear stuff, it should be exciting. If somebody's talking about something that you haven't walked in, rather than go, man, I don't have that. And then you get under pressure, like you have to become that. Yeah. That's not the joy of your relationship. In other words, it ought to make you like spiritually froth at the mouth, man, and go, whoa, that is so pumped and exciting in me. I would love, yeah, God, that's something I can grow in. It should be a perspective that's exciting. It's something being unveiled and released and built in your life. Do you know what I mean? It's that, it's just that I, guys, when you weigh like that and you think, boy, I don't have that. I need to have that because then it has the tone of, I'm not complete till I have that. I'm not qualified till I have that. I'm not accepted. I'm not fully pleasing till I have that. And it puts you back under a yoke. Yeah. Instead of freedom. Here's the, you're already free. You're already loved. Look, while you were yet a sinner, Christ died. Dude, while you were an enemy, with work and works in your mind, he said you're holy, blameless, and above reproach through one sacrifice. You start there and rejoice. And if you look at something in somebody's life or hear a preacher and you get a conviction and say, man, that's never been building me. Wow, I haven't even thought that. Wow, I feel like I'm lacking in that. God, I so thank you for bringing that to my understanding. It is so my privilege to yield to you in that area. God, and then you cut off the old and you put on the new. It's simply through prayer. But the whole time you're doing that, you're fully pleasing to him, especially because your heart cares and you want that. You're, you're, you're a teachable person. In other words, when you see that thing, you're not going, whatever. When you, when you see that thing or hear that thing, you're not going, whatever, or yeah, hey, that's cool, whatever. You know, or you're not just deaf and blind and dumb. You're going, whoa, wow. It's saying something, but don't let it shift. Don't any of you let it shift into where it's works. Like works versus relationship. You know, some people start out, the Galatians started out by grace in the Spirit. And Paul asked, who bewitched them? And how are you going to accomplish in the flesh what you began by the Spirit? You see what I mean? The flesh could be, it doesn't mean some kind of evil flesh sin. It means working things out in your own strength, ingenuity, <laughs> ability, and effort. You have to be careful to just remain in this place of grace. So here's how simple I am. If you want to, if you have a yes in your heart to the things of God and you want to become that, that's your part. You take that into a secret place of prayer and commune that with God and grace says, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> That's how it works. And it's just that simple. Come on. If this wasn't that simple, we'd be like, man, we'd all be like, oh. you know. Come on. Some of us that have grown in the things of God, we'd have spiritual calf muscles. We wouldn't have calf. We'd have cows. We'd have spiritual cow muscles. We'd be so built up, you know, because we've worked so hard. We've done so many reps. I'm saved by grace. <laughs> 
<laughs> Do you get it? It's not just because I've run enough, enough laps. It's because I've believed him. Hear this. this there's, there'll be grace on this. I can tell there's grace on this. I am what I am because I've believed him. Wonder if it's that simple. <laughs> you getting that? It's because I've believed him. I've believed on him. Get it? I know him in whom I've believed. Believing takes you there. It's to the believer. It's, it's, see, we think it has to be something more and intellectual and something we can wrap our mind around. No, it's something you wrap your heart around. What do you believe? He loves me. I'm his. I have the potential of Christ-like life. The Spirit of God lives in me. I'm not lacking any good thing. It's Father's pleasure to give me the I believe all that. Any man that comes in must believe that he, what? That he is. That he is what? Everything he says he is. He is. Shane, he's got a question over there. Comment, whatever he has. It'll be good. Yeah, uh, it it really just hit me yesterday with um, uh, kind of, and this is uh, going off my man's uh, uh, c comment and question that he had. Uh, our culture and kind of our society mixed in with some of our church, we're looking for something to fight for. Uh, we all kind of look for something to fight for, something we can dig into, something we can become. And I've been really struggling with this because for God, I mean, I want to fight for God. I've been thinking of this like a warrior mentality, you know, I need to jump into God, I need to jump into this intimacy to get something to, to grow in Him so that then I can fight for Him. And it, it's very much just a part of our culture and part of who we are. And, and uh, then yesterday, uh, I, I just have it written in my notes that he said, I don't want you to become a warrior, I want you to be a child. You know, that's, that's what you're called to be. And so, as being a warrior, you're always looking for new things that you can that you can use in warfare, that you can run out with, that you can become, that you can take to the battlefield. And so we then, with that, we look at then the works. You know, it's like, oh, I need to get that, or I need to right. have that, so I can now have it be a part of me and fight for you know uh, this God that I love. But love, how He's calling us to love Him, is not as a warrior, not as a I need to fight for this or be this or you know, but simply. Be that child. Be that child. And through that, he gives opportunity. And he, just like in, in your life, right. as you progress, the more and more and more, he uses you as a warrior, and he's developing a warrior's heart, but it's inside the heart in of the child. In the place child. of a child. Is that helping you? That's really, that's, that's really good. That's good. That feels like a clearer answer than I was able to convey to you. Is that helping you? Good, good. It's just really good, but what a good comment for all of us. Because that warrior is in that child. That, that, that's what you become, but that's good. Yeah. You know what you've really taught us is just the child, become the child, and be love, and just love the hell out of them. You don't have to be a warrior. <laughs> I'm going to love the hell out of you. <laughs> so, ah! No, listen, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, oh my God, did he say that? Did she say that? That's a good phrase. <laughs> no, I mean, that was make, Jenny. That was you not know, Dan. Don't make the T-shirts up, you know. But, but, but there's a concept there. That's it's just, oh my goodness. Because here's the deal. If we were created in God's image and Christ came and modeled a life that we're called to live, and He became what we were on the cross, so we can become what He is, it has to be this powerful. Come on, don't turn it into Christian religion trying to live the Christian life. It's being sons and daughters. It's learning what it means to be children of God. Yeah. Amen? Communion with God. Meditating in the Word. There's so many examples. I, I don't care where you open in your Bible, you can use this concept of meditating in the Word. And uh, Todd was messing with me one time. He took the one scripture, I think it was David in the Psalms, and about the, uh, something in the pain and infection or something in my loins or something. <laughs> this, is a, this is a terrible section of scripture. And he said, well, how do you meditate on that, buddy? <laughs> we were driving, and I said, really easy. And I just started to meditate on it. And he went, oh, my gosh. Because <laughs> I, 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 I meditated in New Testament light. 
and finished work of Christ. So, because my mind's renewed. Because he was just being silly, and he's like, meditate on that, dude. <laughs> and, I, and I did, too. And, I, and he just shook his head and laughed like I should have figured he was going to. So, but I want to get into something. Did, you, did I see a hand? Was that your hand? Yeah, in... Um as I've been listening to you over the years and been around you and stuff and, and seeing how free you are. And I've seen you for since early 2000. And you know, you're just as bubbly today as you were back then. Even it's not so. my fault. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe. <laughs> Ooh, and, go ahead. And, and, when you're, and when you're around, around that, you know, you, you, it's like, well, hey, this is really real. So you, you start seeking and finding and and get into that place, like the, the, the soaking, the intimate time with Jesus, the intimate time with God. But along with that, I found, too, it's a place of where you talk about becoming selfless. It's surrendering everything that there is. It doesn't right. matter what, what comes up. If it's not surrendered, it has to be surrendered. That's exactly right. And here's why that's so important. It's not some legalistic thing with God. I have to have all of you or I have none of you. So it's not like that. See... Until you become completely surrendered, you won't completely see different than you've seen before. You'll see through what you don't let go of. You'll exactly. still see through the way that seems right to a man. Where, at what point does your mind get renewed? See? It says, do not be conformed to the world, but... This is phenomenal. Transformed. How? By... The renewing of our mind. I meditate day and night in the Word. I start saying yes to the Word. I yield. That's the place of surrender. All of a sudden, the way that I thought was the way is confronted by the way. And in humility, I yield and say, this is higher wisdom. This is deep. This is awesome. Or, wow, this wasn't wisdom at all. This is the truth. And, and it's a whole joy ride of just being transformed through the knowing of truth. It's, and then your whole eye, this whole gospel is designed to change the eye you look through. To see situations through love, through Him. This is the biggest stumbling of, of our Christian lives. We don't get this understanding. We're just trying to do good works for God. And we're just trying to stay faithful within the church and live a pretty good life and put on a pretty good showing. But we don't, we don't see the change that comes through just seeing everything through love and different and the value of people and, and selfless. See, if there's an ounce of self, you're going to look through the complications of self and whatever that brings and means in a situation. You're going to look at a situation of how this affects me instead of love for the person. Yeah. It's the automatic response. When that's your motive, when there's a motive down in you that's less than surrender, what Anthony's saying, then your eye is going to channel through that and agree with that. And you don't realize because you are pure. You love God. You know you need a Savior. But yet there's still as much fear or anxiety or hurt or jealousy in some people's lives that absolutely you look at them and you know they, they love Him and understand the beauty of what He's done this way. But he wants to take it. He doesn't want to come and just love you. He wants you to become that love because you and him are one and he made you in his image. So the whole finished work of Christ, I say it over and over, is not to get you to heaven. It's to get heaven back inside of you and transform your nature back to his so that you're in the world and not of it and you shine forth as a light holding fast the word of life. It's Philippians 2. Amen? Trish? Did you have a question? Can I repeat it? Or do you have a co long comment? You need a mic? Okay, I'll just repeat it, she said. Um, how do you know, I mean, how can, like, if we're surrendered and not being selfish, how much we're going to be? How much do we... Oh, that's, well, yeah, that's, a good, that's an important question to ask because some people have a doormat. They think they can be a doormat. I, you, I can't be a doormat. Jesus wasn't a doormat. He was the mo that was the most unjust act ever done to a man. He wasn't a doormat. He was the perfect example of love. He took no account of a suffer wrong. And what he did, he did for the better and sake and whole of, uh, of the whole. I mean, for the sake of the whole. He, he gave his life. Our psychological thinking would tell Jesus, man, you don't need to go through this. Man, you can't let people treat you. You just can't let people walk all over you, brother. You are so pure and so loving and mean well. And there's a time, sir, you need to draw a line. You can't go die on that cross. When Peter told him this will never happen to you, he said, Peter, you're listening to the devil and you need to get back in tune with God. 
You know what he said? You're thinking like man thinks. Why? Because man thinks for himself. So watch this. When you're watching Jesus and you begin to value Jesus, now watch, you're going to see something about Peter and why he got so sternly corrected, okay? Because when you start valuing somebody and really caring for somebody and they're meaning something to you, then you sentimentally defend them. You, you attack anything that threatens them because they're a blessing to you. Now we call it love. <laughs> Watch. You know what Peter was saying when he said, this will never happen to you. He was telling him what's going to happen. He said, this will never happen to you. And Peter, Jesus really corrected him. He said, get behind me, Satan. He was saying, man, that mindset's coming straight from the pit of hell. Why? Because it was totally self-serving. It had nothing to do with love for Jesus. It had to do with themselves. Watch what Peter was saying. This can't happen to you. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And ain't nobody taking you from me. I ain't living without you and they aren't doing this to you. You're the best thing that ever happened to me and this shall never happen to you. You're amazing. You're a gift from God. You're awesome. Da, 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 da. And then because of that little twist of self-interest, we start identifying psychologically that, you know, you could be a doormat. I say this and I chuckle because it's so true. Like we have this phrase in the church all the time and I get people to come and they counsel with me all the time and they say, yeah, but you don't understand. They are so emotionally abusing me. And in the church, we believe that's possible and that's why we're emotionally abused. It's impossible for you to emotionally abuse me I know who I am <laughs> totally impossible there's no way you can I don't care if you talk mad at me scream at me and curse me every time I come out of my front door to come to this church if there's people chanting with signs and calling me terrible things how is that emotionally abusing me the only reason in a marriage you can get emotionally abused by your spouse that doesn't see the value of you or who you are is because you don't realize the reason they can't love you is because they can't love themselves. They don't see the value of their own life. They don't love their own flesh. And instead of hurting for them and crying, we get hurt by them instead of hurting for them. And then all our prayers are hinged based on hurt instead of hurting. Oh boy, come on. This is all going to come out in the love thing. and There's a little bit coming out now. But, but, but just because you believe you can be emotionally abused. You're a target. You're just, a, you're just a sitting duck waiting to happen. You're just abuse waiting to happen. You, you can't emotionally abuse me. It's a funny thought to me. See how flaky I get when I preach it? <laughs> Why? Because I know who I am. Come on. If somebody's emotionally abusing me, it's because they don't know who they are and they obviously don't know who I am. So it's their capacity. It's all they know. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Our hearts should cry for people in that situation. It's so important for you to be rooted and established and grounded in truth so that nothing else can eat your lunch and identify you so you don't put on the harsh words of people. You don't put on the neglecting rejection of people. Come on, what are Christians doing rejected and even counseling and talking about it? Because we don't know who we are. How can you reject me now that he's accepted me? And that is not some arrogant, audacious place that says, well, I don't care if you don't like me. You don't have to like me. Jesus loves me. You don't need to accept me. He's accepted me. No, you've already been hurt. Talking like that. It's not some hi-ho triumphant declaration that's at the cost of your value to protect myself. No, it's a sincere man. So how can you reject me? I'm in, guys. So if you don't see the value of my life, if you don't understand the purpose and destiny of your and my life, and you're misreading, and mis why am I rejected? And how can I lay down my life and you not appreciate it and me become a doormat when I love you? Jesus wasn't a doormat. But psychology would reveal him as a doormat. Certain circles and peers, if you left it up to Peter and the disciples... He would have been a doormat. And if Jesus had the ability to be talked out of truth, he could have been maybe compelled then by his peers to not go to that extreme because he's the last person that deserves that. And people just don't appreciate you. And there's a time you need to just take a stand and, and, and let people reap what they sow because da-da-da-da. And you could wrap language around that all day long and miss love. And Jesus would have nothing to do with that. And actually called it the devil, guys. 
He said, you're not thinking like God thinks. You're thinking like man thinks. So he attached the devil and man not thinking like God together. Come on. Sentimentally, we've intervened in situations. Sentimentally, we've counseled and befriended people and people we've taken a liking to and we've tried to protect them, but we've done that out of our own sentimental hearts because we know how we'd feel if they were in their shoes and we're trying to save them from something. Only empowering us to hold on to ourselves. No, we need to be saved from ourselves. That emotionally abused when it doesn't... It's it's very challenging to people because we've embraced the language. We we accommodate. We understand what it means to be emotionally abused, and we accommodate it. We we think it's possible, guys, and because we think it's possible, we are emotionally abused. <laughs> Look, I'm not exploiting my wife, but when I got saved, my wife got saved with me after seven weeks and then I start, I was growing and she started comparing herself to me and other things and people were loving on me and oh, you're amazing and she'd hear this constant, your husband is amazing, your husband is, and then she started to believe that she's not amazing, that they're only talking to her because she's my wife and all of a sudden she has no value, I have all the value and she's just on for the ride. So I would tell her, Kim, don't let that happen to you. That is just a lie. You're this and you're this. Well, you're supposed to tell me that. Well, that's the right thing to tell me. Well, you just need to tell me that. Well, for about six years, she lost herself and went, I've never shared the depth of stuff with you, but she, and now it's on tape and now it's, but it's not her. She, God has been growing her out of all that, but who knows, every person needs God reality for their own heart. Who knows, I can tell you all day you're valuable and loved, but until you get alone and open your heart and say, Father, you really do value me and love me. There's no faith to receive a grace for a revelation. It's just knowledge, and yet there's constantly things contesting it. So my wife went into this deep thing for about six years and didn't even want to live and was like introverted and didn't even want to go out of the house and didn't even want to go to church or nothing. And yet she was my wife. And I'm ministering, call a God. You know, we think we live in a glass house. People Just think what I could have done with that if I didn't understand what I preach to you. See, the reason I preach all this stuff is I have great privilege to manifest it all and walk through all the privileges of trials and adversity, glorying in tribulation because you can manifest truth because it's not about you. So none of it's a pain in the butt or a hard time or, oh my God, you don't know what I've been through. Self-conscious, self-conscious, self-conscious. Man, talk to Jesus, see if it compares. I wonder if he came and said, man, you ain't gonna know what they put me through. Just look at the sad tale he would tell sitting on a rock. <laughs> I was totally perfect, totally pure. I loved people unfailingly and they rejected me. They blasphemed about me. They called me a devil. I actually healed their sick and they called me a demon-possessed Samaritan. They thought I was a devil. They were so bound with religion, so stiff-necked and obstinate, and da 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 And he could just be sitting feeling sorry for himself and want somebody to just understand. Oh, 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 boy, I'm preaching good. (laughs) So think of my language. All of a sudden, I need prayer. I need ministry. All of a sudden, oh, my God, my wife, she's not on page. How can I walk together if I don't have the synergism with my spouse? I'm so limited until she's all, until the devil lets go of her, until God, you deliver. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. Oh, my God, I've got to cover up. I've got to protect. I'm limited. I'm so, oh, brother, would you pray for me? Yeah. Hey, i got a prayer. Yeah, my wife. Oh, my God. I don't even understand what you're saying, but I see it all the time. I never even asked for prayer. I never felt like I needed prayer. (laughs) Can I be honest with you? This might, this might, I don't know if you can hear this, God. I've been saved 16 years. It's not wrong to ask people for prayer. There's times you just, you need encouragement. I don't remember ever feeling like I was hurting and needed prayer. But why? Why? is what I believe. There's always an answer in Him. Is that to mean people that need prayer? No, that's what I don't want you to hear. But what I'm saying is, we all have a story. If I tell you mine in detail, it might be important. I couldn't just because of people involved in exploiting things. But if I tell you my story in detail, you'd probably understand why I'm, I'm what you see. Because I've been through more than you can imagine 
as close to home as you can think called marriage to all kinds of stuff. But it's this I am teaching you and this belief that sees clear the whole way through and doesn't make it what it's not. Because if it would be about me right now and my wife's in that place, I'm in deep trouble. I'm just, now I'm a hard-hearted, subverted minister, never got to fulfill my calling, and there's a deep resentment towards my wife because if she would have been strong and ran with me, we could have done this and went to the nations and did this, and oh my God, and now I'm sitting with regret, and 25 years later, I got sorrow and regret in my heart, and this is my story, and this has become my garment. Come on, that's so twisted. Because the whole time I'm doing that, Jesus is Lord. Are you all following me? So what do you do? Well, you certainly don't get frustrated with Kim because you love her and you understand that she's gone through great identity crisis and deception to the point that the stronghold of what she's believing is, has been so strategically planted that you can't even speak to her because of her ear and you can't even love her. And unless God just supernaturally begins to nurture her and father her, you can't just tell her you're loved by God. You're predestined. There's a time to be born. Well, you're supposed to tell me that. We just, it has to be her revelation. So watch this. So if I'm frustrated with her and, I, and, I'm, and I'm harsh with her and saying, girl, you need to get with it. How am I revealing God's love and releasing God's love? No, I'm walking in total patience. I'm not even, I'm not even in a belief system where where she's at can be a detriment to me at all. It just makes a draw on love. It just makes a draw on compassion and mercy. I'm not married to her for my sake. Hello? See, I can talk like this because I've lived this and lived this. <laughs> and I know what I'm talking about. It's fun for me. Because I watch people. People would call me to pastor them and counsel them in their marriages and weren't even going through an eighth of the things I was in the middle of. And they were calling me and they were devastated. And nobody knew what I was in the middle of. And I was the one giving them counsel and they weren't even going through an eighth of the scenario. And just because their spouse was being mean, they were falling apart. Or are you yeah, this and well, well, they don't ever want to agree with me. Well, when I say this, they want this. When I, I, I can never be one with them. And now they're ready to give up on Christ. I'm like, what? <laughs> time after time, I get these phone calls. I would say, Lord, this is getting funny. <laughs> I'd be like. And I was like, these people are calling me. And it was like, I went, duh. It was like, he said, don't you get it? Because you don't see yourself as a man with a problem. And if your situation is much more extreme than some of these phone calls, don't you see why they're calling you? Because you have something to give them because you don't see you can give them the perspective you're living by without exploiting the situation. Do you get what I'm saying? That's why you hear me say to people, don't, don't exalt your story as if you've been through more than the person beside you. Or we're just making a draw on war stories. And then we're reduced to patting each other and saying, I'm sorry, brother. We've been through that. And we're just comparing ourselves among ourselves with our war stories. And accomplishing what? If anything, permission for being the way we are and the way we feel. And if we can share a deeper story than the next person, we're more qualified to be less whatever. Come on, that's all self. I just saw that this weekend. A lady said, but you don't know what I've been through. I mean, it rose up in her. She's mad. I said, is that what's important? Knowing what you've been through? I said, honey, are we supposed to compare our stories right now? Listen to me, sweetheart. I took her by the face, held her, looked her in the eyes. You've seen Christ in me all day. That's why you're talking to me. You respect me in the Lord. Don't you shift gears on me. I got that straight with her and held her face. That's how I am with folks. Because <laughs> I love people. And I don't need to set her straight. I want to rescue her from the lie that's eaten her lunch. I don't need to be right and show her up. I want to see her free. And it got to the point where she laid on me and bawled and cried. It was really fun. But what was coming out was the justification of her feelings that were unsanctified. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what he did to me. Could you imagine God the Father sitting on the throne, looking at humanity, saying, you'll never know what they did to me. I created them with a vision and a hope. I gave them one command and they broke that. 
and many more since. They don't even look nothing like me. And I'm their father, and they don't even seem like they really care most of the time. And the list would go on and on if God sat with that mentality and viewed humanity, wouldn't it? And then we assume the right to even have one-liners and, and situations with that mindset. No, let's let old things pass away, and behold, all things become new so we can rightly assess life through him. Because if God's not sitting on the throne assessing you that way, why do you embrace the right to look through other eyes? It's the only place you're going to find truth. That's why the church is hurt, rejected. Well, I was really hurt by the church. What are you doing hurt? What do you mean you were hurt by the church? You see what I'm saying? I understand there's innocent young people and they come into the church and da-da-da and they don't know and they get taken. But somebody needs to be there to impart truth to them rather than wrap their arm around around and say, yeah, I'm sorry, I got hurt too. Or yeah, I know, it can be that way, man. Let me tell you what I was through six years ago. Maybe this will help make you feel better. No, it won't. It will affirm their position. We're trying to relate Instead of set free. <laughs> Come on. I had a person say to me once, well, did you ever, were you ever addicted to drugs? No. Well, then you can't minister to me because you don't know what it's like. I said, of course I can. I've been addicted to sin and I've been addicted to myself. I don't have to have done drugs to minister truth to you and walk in the anointing on my life. Don't you believe that lie? <laughs> And I talk to them about being in a prison my whole life. My identity's captured, and that's all that's going on with you. You've just lost sight of who you are. You don't know who you are. I didn't know who I was either. So we have more in common than you think. Don't think I've had to use drugs to minister to you. I've just had to been fallen and saved, and I was, and so were you. (laughs) Come on, that's simple. We get so technical, so psychological. We bring so much intellect into this gospel that we limit grace and the truth so many times. You don't realize how much we value our opinions and how we've taken the way that seems right to man and just human psychology and integrated it into the gospel of truth. And I'm not a fan of that at all. It doesn't bring freedom. It actually gives you excuses for the flesh, limitation, and to remain the same. And I've found a reason to change. And if I can't find the way I'm thinking in the gospel and in the kingdom of God, why am I thinking that way if I'm his son? If God never saw me that way, why am I seeing you that way? I challenge myself in that stuff. And it's brought me to a place where I feel like my eyes have been fine-tuned to his. Does that make sense? We've actually had a bunch of hands go up, and I was kind of overlooking them. But where was hands? I was just kind of in the middle of a point. It doesn't mean, remember I told you in the beginning, you have to give me, if I don't call on you, it just means I'm, we all Okay. Hang on. So mostly your people come to you and you're going to teach them basically what you're teaching us, who they are, rather as than, opposed to praying for them. Rather than minister them. We are so ministry minded. We're so quick to try to move in the ministration of Holy Spirit. There's a place where one touch of God can just position your life, transform your life, change your life. I understand that. I honor the touch of God. And I pray that way with people a lot. But where the strength of my heart is, he's the Lord is the spirit of counsel. And we need a good teacher called Jesus' life, right? The gospel to impart truth to us. Because what's our best friend? Truth is your best friend. What makes you free? What makes you free? The touch of God's presence or truth? You could say, well, the touch of God's presence. Well, the touch of God's presence is awesome. But the Bible says truth makes you free. Do you understand what I'm saying? So truth's your best friend. Now watch this. Somebody comes to an altar and they want prayer. That's one thing and that's fine. And I can pray for them. But when I hear their heart or I see where they're coming from, I have more of a faith and more of a conviction in my heart to address the way they're thinking. Because I know this. I know that if I pray for them and nobody imparts truth in the way that they're thinking and helps adjust them, if they continue to think the same, they'll experience the same. And somewhere down the road, not even too far, they'll be up here again for some level of prayer in the same manner. And they're waiting for the touch of God instead of the transformation of truth. I'll let you then. Yeah, let, let, She's going to share one more comment and then give it to Brent. However, so we got that. 
Now, however, in the situation for your wife, I'm sure there were times, maybe all the time, that you prayed for her, not in front of her necessarily, but you pray. I'm a different guy probably in that way. I didn't intercede every day for her. I have a calling. I have a destiny. I live by faith. I'm in a position of faith. So who knows if you add up those situations that are dear to your heart and you begin to intercede all day, you are consumed with what we call prayer. It is, it's faith. Pretty much. Pretty much. That's how I live. I, I said, Father, that is not who she is. And I thank you that has no power over my life. You have taught me to love. My God, you love her so much. Thank you for bringing her up and out, teaching her, confirming her heart, and give me the wisdom to just continue to manifest you and be like you are to her and be a living example. Thank you for the wisdom to love my wife and be a husband under her. And da da da. And I'm going to run this race. I was, I was questioning if I was doing right. There's always people that tell, well, yeah, but you should be interceding every day. I had a friend that interceded day and night for their child, and God visited them in the night, and da-da-da. And we throw all those experiences and testimonies up, and, and then we write another book, How God Delivered My Child. And then we're all trying to do what that person did. And now we're mechanical Christians trying to grab a hold of other people's testimonies. How about just where faith is? When I got saved, my, my marriage was over. My wife was not in a good place. And when I got saved, I thought I hated her. I was actually happy. We were finally dividing because I thought, I'm going to find me a, a new girl and just live my life and get a new model. I'll just start over. It'll be fun and exciting. And that's where my mind was. And I was like, who cares? And I was really in that place. As soon as I got saved, I knew I loved my wife. She wasn't in a place like that. But here's what I said to the Lord. I said, Father, if I'd have been living in Christ all these years and living what I was created to be, none of this would look like it does. I release her of all responsibility. It has nothing to do with anything she's ever done wrong. It has to do with me not being sincere with my heart and life and living for your glory. And God, I release my wife from this marriage and a sense of responsibility. And I take responsibility on my end that I have not been a man of God. And I know your will is to restore my marriage and I put it on the altar of your mercy and I thank you, your will be done. And I never even thought about or prayed for my marriage one more time. Seven weeks later, God, the Holy Spirit, came into the bathroom and illuminated my wife and that was an amazing story. A year to a year and a half later, as I was really growing the Lord and started entering more into ministry stuff, is when these things started hitting my wife. And I saw it happening very subtle. And I would address it, and she would just kind of wouldn't say much. And then it happened even more. And then all of a sudden, it was out in the open, and she's crying, and I'm just your wife. And I'm thinking, well, that ain't a bad thing. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> I'm just your wife. And I'm like, what do you mean? And I realized what she's saying is, people only acknowledge me because of who you are. People only pay attention to me because I'm with you and it's the thing to do. It's not because I'm special. And she started believing that. To where, when I remember one day walking into the kitchen, I said, hey girl, and I spun her around. I just had come in and I said, you're this and that. And she just stared at me and said, thank you. And I went, whoa. I said, honey, if anything ever just went right past you that I said, it was right there. It kind of bounced off that window back there. And I said, listen, I said, I know you're going through stuff, but I said, the Bible's true, and it says that about you. It's not the right thing to say. It's the truth. I kissed her on the forehead and went and changed. And did my, I didn't, man, she won't even receive my love. And Man, I don't know what's wrong with my wife. Why doesn't she get with it so we could just, doesn't have to be this way. What? See, that's self-serving. That's me and the relationship for me, and now it's all about how she's not making my day better. And now I'm a man with a troubled spouse. I don't understand that. You read your Bible about love and about even marriage and about our hearts getting hard. Your heart can't get hard. when It's in the position of love. And it doesn't say unless your spouse this and this and this and this. Your heart can't get hard when your heart's fashioned by love. Or God would have cut somebody off by now. Now, I know that's strong language and it causes a lot when you talk like this because people have histories. Past. Look, you might have done something you didn't know better then. You might be in a different position now. But, but that's all learn and grow through it all. And that's that life in Christ be our teacher in life. Amen? Amen. So I know that's a heavy statement because there's people that have been divorced. There's people remarried. There's people, all kinds of stuff. What I'm saying is, you know who you were. 
And you know who you're becoming. Let who you are today be the finished work of his love. You see what I'm saying? Instead of letting that just be your resume. There's people that have made mistakes in their marriage and shut off and cut off and grow to realize what they did years later and go, God, that could have been different. Oh, that's when changes. That's repentance. That's new creature reality. And all of a sudden, they're not even that person. And all of a sudden, wow. So rather than go, oh, man, no, wow, there's a whole new way of living. That's the kingdom, not regret. Amen? So it's very hard sometimes. There's so much with relations and marriage and so much pain. My concern is all the pain in people's hearts because of these things. And I'd rather address the pain. Pastor said it on Sunday. You know, you need to pray for my husband so he stops pushing my buttons. And pastor's saying, I want to pray that there's no more buttons. Why is there buttons? Let's get rid of the buttons. Come on. Okay, Satan pulls the control panel of Catherine's life out. And looks at her vulnerabilities in her life through her words, her emotions, her past, and her resume. And he checks the control panel of her life. And he says, well, if I just press here, it seems to me if I just press here, here, and here, ha ha, get a good response. And he slides that back in. That's what happens to people all the time. He knows just where to push. Because he knows what determines your joy, your encouragement. He knows. And all of a sudden he's pressing. We got to get to the place where we grow in love to where there's nothing to push. Or if he pushes it, it's out of order. It doesn't work anymore. It used to work. It doesn't work anymore. He used to push that thing and have you for three weeks a mess. And then you'd slowly and then he'd push it three weeks a mess. And after a while you were so tired of getting up because you're so tired of being a mess that now you're just way late. No, he wants, God wants to get you in a place where he pulls out and pushes it and there's just no avail. There's nothing to push because your perspective's changed. And your reality sits in a different place. So that's true when Pastor preached that, that fence message. was really good. So he's carrying a fence around. A fence. <laughs> See his little fence? That's his offense. So his sermon was living without a fence. <laughs> so he talked, but it was just good. But, but his question was, why do you have so many buttons to push? Because if you're living with buttons to push, it's just a matter of time till it's getting pushed. If I expectations, put expectations all over your shoulders. See, here's the funny thing. You're to live trustworthy in the sight of God and man. But I'm not to put my trust in you. But you're to live trustworthy. But I'm not to put my trust in you. By the time I put my trust in you, then my expectation is disappointed. And all I can see you for is your failure and weakness. And then I miss the value and potential of your life because all I can remember is how you failed me. You put your trust in no one. Your expectation is from the Lord. See, you're called to love. Watch this. Oh, this is going to stretch you. You're called to love, not be loved. The be loved comes from Jesus. Is it nice to be loved? Are we all called to love one another? But if I hold you to that, I'm going to miss my part. Now I'm going to search out an atmosphere to see if it's loving. And it should be because I'm there. (laughs) Well, I went over to that church. I ain't never going back there again. That was right. There was nobody even greeted me. There wasn't no love in the house, man. And now you're just a product of that lovelessness. And now you just have a criticism and a gossip. And you're sowing that into 40 other people's souls for the next two years. And you're painting a picture of an atmosphere because you went in there with a deficit, assessing, searching, instead of just being. Because if I walk into an atmosphere being love, I'm not aware of what's not coming at me called love because I'm busy loving. Because I'm not on the earth for you to love me. I'm on the earth to love you. Hello? Come on. God made man in His image and God is... So we're created to be love, not to need love. When God... And man got cut off through sin. He became in desperate need of love because the source of love got cut off. So he started looking for love. And every one of us was born into that deficit. That's why until you get formed in Christ and molded in Christ and understanding through Christ, you really can't love like Christ. You can need one another. And we say, I love you. But we're really saying, I love you. Do you love me? 
And it's an emotional exchange. It's a self-serving emotional, I do for you, you do for me mentality. Psychology, 50-50. Marriage, 50-50. What are you talking about? If you have a mentality that says marriage is 50-50, then you have an expectation on your spouse and they can fail you because it might be 60-40 and hey, you better pick up the slack pile. I'm carrying more than I need to. Where's love? It's love. It's not 50-50. It's I love you. I'm not seeking my own. I give myself to you for your sake. That doesn't sound like, now make sure you pay up your end. I love you. See, we don't understand. I've read, I, I, actually, I haven't read Christian relationship books that reveal Christ. They just, it's the world's way with Christian attached to it. It's, it's the camouflage. It's, it's, the, it's the way the world lives with Christian incorporated. All right, it's Christian psychology, and, and uh, I'm not saying that in a demeaning way that I'm against Christian psychologists. What I'm saying is the mindset that comes from God can't be intertwined with fallen man. We assess fallen man, his relationships, his emotional patterns, and we lock him into that when we're born again and all things are new. Why are we assessing a fallen man and how he functions, operates, feels, and thinks, and then trying to accommodate that when that's to change? That's why I tell people I'm either the most deceived man on the planet and in deep denial and need serious help now or I'm free and I'm banking on free. free. Yeah. I just am because of the eye I live through. Because look, I was created to love, not be loved. So if I know that and become that in prayer, you don't owe me a thing. So you can't fail and break my heart because you're not in position to. Why? Because I love you. How many relationships start out starry-eyed and loving and now they won't even talk to each other and they even say, I hate them? Because you don't even understand love. It's just an immature human. It's a fallen, it's starry-eyed, so it's self-serving. It's I need you for now. <laughs> That's why you can see a person when they're saying they're in love, there's a person that all of a sudden they look at the person and just say, Look, I just, things are changed and I just don't think I love you anymore. It's not like it used to be. I just don't love you anymore. And they look cold and callous and they can just walk away like nothing, unscathed. And they've slept together. They could even have two children together. And all of a sudden they're just like, I don't think I love you anymore. What? This is a jacket you put on and off? What do you, what do you mean? Well, and then psychology explains it. Church counselors explain it. Ah! No, you never understood love. You needed them and now you shifted and changed and your life changed and something shifted and you don't see the value in them anymore because they don't, you don't have the need they used to meet. Something's changed and you can just as cold cut them off because they're of no value to you anymore. And then they're hung, devastated, can't even live, can't even go on without you. And we call that codependency and da-da-da. Well, it's, it's because it was needs driven in the first place and this need still hasn't changed. And now you're my life walking away. And I can't live without you. Well, who's that? I can't live without you. Where's that go? Who's that be- who does that belong to? Not this. The reason this should be here is because this is true and I've come to who I am in Christ now, the fullness and strength of my life. I can finally love you, not need you. So because I can't live without you, I have the capacity to love you. So out of the fullness of God in the man, he reached in and brought forth the woman. So if there's a woman, it should come out of the fullness of God in the man. Not just because, I love you, ooh, you make my blood boil, or whatever. <laughs> I'm not the best romantic with that stuff. It's smell <laughs> to me. <laughs> it's, ah, it's just that starry-eyed thing, man. And all of a sudden, you're making babies and breaking each other's hearts. Yeah. Can I be honest? It takes one person in a relationship to understand what I'm preaching. To see God in it. Don't you say, because they, well, they won't, well, they don't, well, they're this, they're that. Psst. 
Don't even, you, you can't even, you're not going to get anywhere with me on that one. It takes one person to be like Christ. To have love in the midst. Because you ain't changing Jesus. When you hang around him long enough, something's going to change. But you ain't changing Jesus. You show me how man has changed God over the generations. You can't, but I can show you how God has changed man. Why? Because love never fails. Why? Because it doesn't take into account of a suffered wrong because it doesn't seek its own. Love loves you. That's so powerful. It takes one. I've taught that for years as a pastor. And people look at you. It takes one person in a household to hold on to love. Even the Bible says the believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse. It says or else the children would be unclean. So a spouse after spouse have come to me. Well, yeah, but he's into this and she's into that. And now my kids and this and in the house and ooh. And it's just ooh. I'm like, what? You're the believer. You rule and reign in the realm of the kingdom. Rise up and rejoice that the Spirit of God is in you. And let your believing heart sanctify the unbelief all around you. And look at your children and know they're blessed. Not, well, this is going to lead them to this. And now they're going to be into this because of... See, and then you say that and then it happens and there's no help. There's no hope. It's just despair and desperation. But if you're in this place of faith, even if some of that starts taking place, you've trained them and taught them in the way. Your faith is before the throne and God's grace is on them. And as they grow old, they won't depart. You might even see a messed up, twisted season and you just rejoice because you see deeper than that and bigger than that. And you say, Father, I so thank you for what I know that I can't even be moved by this. It'd be nice if they'd spare themselves of this. But God, I thank you. You won't spare them your love. Thank your hand is upon them. (sighs) See, that sure beats despair and fear and oh my God and see if it wasn't for them. And then you hate them all the more because of what they did to our kids. And if it wasn't for you and uh, and regret and uh, and now it's like Christ never even came. I'm done. (laughs) I'm done. We'll get on to this a little more though. This love thing will be good. I still have my confession sheet. I'll do my best to hit it tomorrow. (laughs) But this is school. You get on other topics. Amen? Can we do something? Can we stand to our feet and just honor Him and yield to Him? I just feel like, I don't know why, I don't remember doing that in the last school. It's not something we did before. I just feel like it's humbling to stand before Him and honor Him as King and the just and righteous judge, whether you want to lift your hands or whatever, but please turn your heart to Him. Father, Your way is the way that's right and righteous, unchanging and unfailing. Your love is amazing. And what I'm excited about and what I thank you for is that everyone in this room is entitled to your kingdom through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I ask that you continue to open up our understanding, our want to, our desire, and our wills to you that we surrender and become one with you. Give us grace, each one of us, in our respective situations, lives, the way our minds have been molded and shaped in things, the way we think, the eyes we look through. Let it all come together and be one big revelation of truth and let us all be found in one faith, one spirit, and one love. Father, I ask you to have your way in every one of us and continue to let these things cultivate us and groom us and shape us to look like you. We want to look like our daddy. We want to be just like you. Let us not just get what you can do for us, but how you can make us more like you. Father, we're not fixed on what you can do for us, but how you can make us more like you. I don't want to just be free in my finances. I want to be free in my heart. I want to be free in my mind. I want whatever I do to prosper because it's coming from a pure place called the love of God. And I ask your grace on every one of us right now. And I feel like, Lord God, there's a couple people even challenged with some of this right now we've shared in the last 20, 30 minutes. I ask you to work it all out and have your way and make sense and interpret this truth into their present situation and let them make sense of the truth and see clear and come out of it looking and living just like you. Father, I thank you. I bless this school. I bless these people, everyone on the internet. Just thank you for your word becoming flesh in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you all.